Now let's talk specifically about participatory budgeting. Okay, so normally we're talking about a relatively local level here, uh, like say, you know, a district of New York. And again, last I checked, over half of the New York districts were using some type of participatory budgeting. Uh, and so really the government wants just to know what are the preferences of its constituents. So which of the various public projects you could fund, you know, improving the roads, improving the schools, you know, building a new park, the various public projects that they could undertake they can't do them all because that would be too expensive. So they have to pick a subset and they would like feedback from the community about which of the possible public projects would be most valuable to them. So the setup then is really pretty simple. So uh, you've got some budget, capital B, that's the total expenditure possible on public projects. And then there's some number of projects you could undertake if you wanted, each of which has a known cost. So you know project number one is $1 million, project number two would be a half a million dollars, et cetera. And all this stuff is known. So in other words, when voters cast their votes, they will be told, you know, what is the budget available uh, and what is the cost of each of the projects. The key constraint, of course, is that you can't undertake all of the public projects. You need to undertake a subset of the public projects uh, whose overall cost is at most the available budget. And the question then is to decide, you know, which subset uh, are the projects that are going to be undertaken. So let's look at an example. Uh, let's suppose that we have a budget of $1 million, and let's suppose we have three projects. Uh, the first project would cost a million dollars, and then each of the second and third projects would cost a half a million dollars. In this example, kind of the two different outcomes you might expect to happen is you might expect the government to choose to just undertake the first project, spend the whole million dollar budget on that, or alternatively, maybe they forget about the first project and they do the second and third projects. Uh, again, spending the entire budget. Those are kind of the two things you'd expect to happen. But the government still has to make the decision about which of those uh, it prefers. And so that's the whole point of voting, having citizens vote, express a preference about which of these projects uh, would be most valuable to them. So the question then is, how exactly should you elicit the preferences of voters? Right? So what should the ballot look like? And um, certainly, you know, in, in when, when people were first thinking about participatory budgeting, they wanted to keep things simple, right? So first of all, they wanted voters to be able to understand what it was they were voting for. They didn't want it to be too complicated. Um, but also they were thinking about like paper ballots. So you needed something that would be practically implement, implementable in a paper ballot setting. So for those reasons, you know, the, the most common thing you see is a very simple uh, voting uh, mechanism known as K approval voting. K here is a parameter, that's the number of public projects on which a voter can give a thumbs up, right? And that's all the voters are gonna be allowed to do in K, K approval voting, thumbs up or thumbs down, and then K will be the constraint on how many thumbs up uh, they can give. So K maybe, you know, could be three, could be five, uh, it's gonna depend. Okay, so all the votes come in, you get sort of up to K votes from each of the voters, and the question remains, you know, uh, what decision should you make? What public projects should you actually undertake given the votes that you received? And, you know, there's no reason to sort of weight one vote any higher than any other vote. Uh, so the sensible thing to do is just go, go to each project one by one and sum up all of the votes that they got. So how many voters said thumbs up on project number one? How many said that on project number two, et cetera? Then, you know, you're going to rank the projects from the most popular to the least popular. So you want to start by funding the most popular project and then work your way downward. With the project sorted by popularity from most popular to least popular, um, the natural way to spend the funding is just to go through the projects in that order, fund projects until you don't, until you don't have any budget remaining. All right, so presumably you have enough budget just to, for the first project by itself. So the, first, the most popular project is going to get funded. You might or might not have enough budget left over to fund the second most popular project. If so, great, you go ahead and fund it. Uh, you move on to the third most popular project. You check if there's enough budget still left for that one also. If so, great, fund it. You know, if not, you have to stop. Uh, you know, and then finally, there'll be some project on which you run out of your budget, on which everything's exhausted. And there's different ways you can sort of handle um, what happens at the end. But for this lecture, let's just assume that that final project where you run out of your budget, that that gets funded partially. So that will make sense in some applications, but not others. But for this lecture, let's assume that, you know, when you run out of money, that last chunk of money goes to partially fund, you know, say the fourth project that you got to. So, for example, maybe the project was to renovate the roads in a neighborhood and you wind up, you know, having enough money to renovate half the roads in the neighborhood. That's what we're going to uh, assume happens.
That's uh, K approval voting, and it certainly has the benefit of being simple, pretty easy to understand. You just pick your K favorite projects and vote for them. Uh, it does have one serious problem, however, which is um, it does not force voters to really be cognizant of the costs of the various projects. To explain, let's sort of continue with our three project example. Um, and now let's suppose that, uh, you know, let's actually impose the voters' preferences. And let's even say they all feel exactly the same way about the three different projects. Let's suppose that every voter agrees that project number one would generate value four per voter, uh, whereas project number two would generate value three per voter, and project number three would generate value two per voter. In this case, we don't necessarily expect uh, the best outcome from K approval voting. Let's say that K is equal to one. Okay, so of these three projects, every voter has to pick one that they vote for. You know, the answer here is going to depend on exactly how voters reason about their various options. Um, but probably the simplest way to vote, if you just have this one vote available, would be to look at the three projects and say, which one do I feel like generates the most value? And so in this case, that would be project number one. And so if all or if most of the voters, you know, follow that intuition and say, well, I can only vote for one, let me vote for the most valuable one, which would be project number one, then project number one is going to be the most popular one. And that's going to be the one that gets funded. Now, project one, that occupies the entire budget. So that means projects two and three are not going to get funded. Uh, and if you look at it, that's actually not what we want to have happen, right? So the value per voter, uh, if we fund both two and three, that would be three plus two, which equals five. So everybody would get, every voter would get $5 of value if, you, if we funded projects two and three, but they only get value four per voter uh, if you fund project number one. So what seems like the likely outcome of one approval voting uh, is not Pareto optimal. It's a term we heard before. So Pareto optimal just means, so it's easier to explain what, what it means to not be Pareto optimal. So you're not Pareto optimal if there's some other outcome where literally everybody would be better off. Okay? And that's really what you want to avoid, right? So at the very least, you want to be Pareto optimal so that making somebody better off would unfortunately have to make someone worse off also. And so what we're seeing here is that what seems like the likely outcome of one approval voting in this example would not be Pareto optimal. There would be a way to make everybody better, which is to spend that budget not on project number one, but rather on projects uh, number two and three. And again, what's really going wrong here is that approval voting does not force voters to take into consideration uh, the cost of the various projects. It sort of leads them to think primarily about just the value of those projects, not the value relative to the costs. In summary, you know, K approval voting, it is uh, sort of elegant and simple, which explains why it's uh, been so frequently used. And it's also obviously something you can implement pretty easily with a paper ballot. Um, but it has some issues, right? This seems like a big flaw that it doesn't force the voters to rec you know, reckon with the costs of the projects. So it's then our duty to ask, could we do better? Could we have an alternative way of eliciting preferences in a participatory budgeting context so that we don't have these problems or so that these problems are less severe? So that's going to bring us to uh, the next slide where I want to tell you about something called knapsack voting.